Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Hollywood After Dark. It is February 27th, 2024. Tonight, folks, Netflix holds its... Ha- it, it's holding everyone hostage. Massive, massive price increases. Middling quality from a lot of the content. It's basically holding you there with a gun to your head saying, pay us or else. And quite frankly, none of the other streamers are going to be able to hold up to that. Not only that, we got a bunch of uh, uh, roadhouse drama and some interesting ways to fight AI in Hollywood. It's Hollywood After Dark. Let's go. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How y'all doing? Welcome to the party. Welcome to the show. It's Hollywood After Dark. It is Tuesday, the 27th of February. We're almost done. Two more days till leap year. How are you going to celebrate your leap year? You're going to go watch a special movie? One, I don't even know. That's not even a stupid thing I want to ask anybody. But what I do want to ask you guys is what movies do you want me to cover? Remember, starting tomorrow, we're going to be bringing back the patio commentary on Batman Under the Red Hood. We'll be premiering on this channel. Going to watch it tonight, record my thoughts. This is a sponsored episode of the show. But if you guys have suggestions for movies you want me to watch, be sure to let me know in the comments section. Uh, I do really appreciate everybody who pays attention. I did put this out over on the... Uh, on the community tab on the YouTube page, uh, talking about Vocaroo and voice line call-ins. We have voicemail, 323-400-4956. You can call in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Leave your thoughts about current events. I want to hear them. Or if you live outside the United States or just don't want to use the phone, and that's okay. Not a lot of people do. You can, in fact, go to vocaroo.com, record your audio message, and then send me a link and I will be able to get it. You can do that at three buck theater at gmail.com is the email as well as just look on the community tab here on YouTube and you should be able to find a link that will allow you to do that. Uh, then I should be able to get that information sent over to me because I do want to have conversations with you guys, especially as I get busier into my work season. I won't be able to stream as much, won't be able to have direct conversations. So I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what your thoughts are on this stuff because uh, a lot of you do listen and I would love to to find a way to, he- to be able to validate your thoughts and your opinions and actually have a conversation, even if it is through this particular medium. And this medium, folks, is definitely wild. It is crazy. And let's just dive right the hell on in because let's talk about artificial intelligence, especially how to combat it. All right. So this is what's going on right now. This I thought was an interesting article popping up on Variety today. Shane Black, Jim Hertzfield, and more top writers fight fight, fight AI with a gauntlet script analysis team. This is something that uh, might uh, might work for some people, may not work for others. The uh, the consensus on Reddit from what I've been looking at has not necessarily been great, but let's talk about the highlights of the article here. So a group of Hollywood writers and creatives, including Shane Black, Jim Hertzfield, and Akila Cooper, who wrote Megan, last, last year's Megan, by the way. So I don't know if you'd call her a great writing talent. I, I didn't think Megan was that well written, to be honest with you. Uh, But anyway, they've collaborated on a new tech platform called The Gauntlet. I feel like there should be an echo or reverb when I say that to make it sound greater than it is. Uh, But their whole point here is that they want to keep human script analysts rather than AI assessing screenplays or, you know, or an intern that's told to read a whole bunch of scripts and give their thoughts on the ones they think are best. Anyway. Script Hopped, which is a Hollywood tech company, is launching the gauntlet with 30 freelance script and uh, analysts from companies like HBO and Lucasfilm. It will be the largest organized group of professional readers. And there's some pedigree in there, right? People who have run the gauntlet of Hollywood, who understand the ins and outs of getting a project sold, hell, getting a project made and getting it out into the masses. These are people who do have experience working in the industry and that is something that is going to be i guess you could argue like really 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 sought after if you happen to be a screenwriter when i moved to la in 2010 i went there to write and being a writer in la sucks because there's no money in it there's just no money in it right this was after the writer strike from 2008 uh well before the one that just happened it's hard to do writing in la because everybody wants to do it quite frankly everyone thinks they can do it Well, uh, and a lot of people just tend to kind of write well, but then everything they do just gets kind of yeeted and and, and skeeted by the studios, uh, which is one of the reasons why the same guy who wrote Madam Web wrote Morbius, wrote The Last Witch Hunter and a bunch of other movies that you might think are not great 
but he still gets work because apparently his first drafts are pretty good. But anyway, I'm kind of getting off topic here. The gauntlet, this is what they want you to do. This is how you get in the gauntlet, okay? They want screenwriters to pay $380 to have their script read by at least seven analysts to prevent one person's opinion from ending its chances. The scripts advance through levels with more readers if they perform well. So it is very much a thing of where you got it, you got it, you got to gamble, four hundred dollar gamble, to put this in there to get people to read it, and it's got to go through different levels in order to be able uh, to to get to the top. Now you got writers like Ed Solomon who did Men in Black, Dana Stevens and Jim Ools uh, d- uh, helped design the system to give screenwriters direct Hollywood access to vet and shop screenplays. Readers simultaneously work for major studios while freelancing. The system tasks them to read the scripts based on levels reached within the gauntlet, meaning the higher up you go, my, this is my take on it. This is my opinion on it. The higher up you go, the, the higher pedigree of screenwriter, I guess you're going to be able to get right. The higher pedigree, you're going to be able to have a look at your, uh, put eyeballs on your work and give their thoughts and opinions provided that you have the chops to do it. Now, uh, and again, these are people who are going to be working simultaneously for uh, major studios while they're freelancing. Part of me can't really help but think like this is going to be a a lawsuit in the future claiming copyright, saying saying someone's going to say like I submitted a script to the gauntlet. Um, let's say Ed Solomon. I'm just using the name because it's right here in front of me. Ed Solomon wrote read it, and then later on uh, wrote a story for the studio that had a very similar concept. I I mean I'm I'm all for writers helping writers, and we all know that the vast majority of work is derivative of one thing or another. We all know this. This is not anything you can really argue. But still, but still, you know, it's one of those things where where you, you just gotta. You got to wonder when that's going to happen. And it's definitely going to happen. Hollywood is very litigious and people oftentimes think that their ideas are stolen when they are just simply, you know, people can come up with the same concept. You know what I mean? Anyway, it does offer or it does aim to provide a consensus of professional human opinions rather than simply just isolated decisions or algorithms that are assessing the script's potential. Because, yeah, they do use algorithms and AI to, to read these scripts and look for certain things, and they, they do this. This, is, this has been talked about. Ben Affleck, his company with Matt Damon has done this. Uh, Warner Brothers, Toby Emmerich a number of years ago talked about using AI to help vet screenplays faster in order to find out what's going to be more commercially viable. It's, it's wild to think that's where we are. Uh, writers were all upset about AI being used to write the screenplays when AI is already being used to control what ends up getting made or getting approved to move on to the next process. Now, these top scripts, this is where we get into like why you're going to probably want to do this if you're a screenwriter. These top scripts will be searchable by industry companies through a database and promoted through a weekend read subscription, meaning that like the the database will be there for the studios, the executives, the creative executives, uh, the development people, whatever, to be able to then like look to see what exactly is kind of floating around uh, at the gauntlet, the top scripts that have made their way to the top. This is almost like another version of the blacklist, but it's going to be something where uh, for right now, it, it doesn't have the pedigree. But they are definitely hoping later on to be able to go, this script would made its way through the gauntlet, right? I mean, like, that's obviously the point. If they can get the pedigree, then more writers will pay the $400 to be able to send their script through. And I feel like that's a lot of money, especially in this economy, uh, you know. But then at the same time, part of me is like, well, I have a script idea that I'm kicking around that I want to write. And then maybe, maybe, you know, I'll save up my cash tips from work. Uh, you know, and then be able to to put that money down um, as a way to try it. Maybe I'll try it and I'll and I'll and I'll write back or I'll talk back about it later on as time goes on. But okay, let's move on to the next story of the day, and this has a lot of people out there breathing a sigh of relief because apparently Warner Brothers Discovery halts its merger with Paramount Global, according to sources. And this is a big deal because when this was talked about the other day, a lot of people were very curious. If David Zaslav was going to find a way to take over Paramount Plus or Paramount from Viacom and do God knows what with it, considering what he's done with Warner Brothers over the course of the last year. But apparently that is not happening. Here's what we know. The Warner Brothers Discovery team has stopped talks about potentially acquiring Paramount Global after several months of exploring a merger between the two media companies. 
Skydance Media, on the other hand, the film and Steve, uh, TV studio run by David Ellison, is still doing its due diligence on a potential deal with Paramount. Skydance has a lot of deals. They've worked a lot with Paramount over the years. It would make a lot of sense for them to find a way to merge together. And I do think that Skydance would largely be able to kind of correct course for whatever the hell Paramount's been up to. Because right now, Paramount is basically just like Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movies and the Yellowstone universe, never mind Nickelodeon and, and all that stuff aimed at kids, obviously. Or I just, just, just because I know one person's going to freak out with me saying that animation is for everyone, Brandon. Okay, calm down. But Paramount has set up a special committee and hired a financial advisor to review potential bids for the whole company or just certain assets. Media mogul Brian Allen offered $14 billion, but has a history of big media bids not panning out, which makes sense. This guy comes over and he just throws down a bid of 14 bill and, you know, it, they go through it and it falls apart and it's a big waste of everybody's time. I understand why they want to uh, do this properly and accurately, you know, cross the T's and dot the lowercase I's. Now, Comcast, on the other hand, is not interested in in buying Paramount's assets, but has explored potential commercial partnerships involving bundling or merging Peacock and Paramount Plus streaming services. But it's unclear at this moment in time if Paramount is interested. Uh, I mean, look, a lot of us are thinking it's either going to be called P-Mount or Paracock. And I think Paracock is probably going to be a name that's going to get a lot of people really interested, although it's not for porn. So you might think, eh, well, it maybe it ain't the greatest. But look, it, it, Comcast right now is saying that they're not interested all right, like in Universal, because like Universal and Warner Brothers seems like the obvious bid, right? That seems like the obvious next merger. These companies are eventually just going to keep merging and merging and merging. It, you know, monopolies be damned. The the F uh, was it the FTC be damned. It's just going to happen. The streaming bubble has burst in many ways, and these companies have got to get their bailouts, especially in order to appease their shareholders which is the main reason why these tech companies have gotten into the streaming world and the entertainment world, because they want that money that comes from that. Anyway, we don't know what's going to happen right now, though Comcast is kind of playing its cards close to its chest, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Zaslav and the CEO of uh, Comcast decide to uh, work together. But speaking of David Zaslav, he and Paramount CEO Bob Bash uh, Backish did have preliminary merger conversations back in uh, December with more serious talks in January, but discussions have now cooled off. And this is odd considering that Warner Brothers Discovery shares have fallen 47% in the past year after recent earnings and revenue misses nearing a 52 week low. However, we need to remember that Warner Brothers just signed that deal with Tom Cruise and he's gonna be in the Inaritu movie, right? coming out and that's going to be a big one uh they are currently trying to court christopher nolan back over to warner brothers which was his original home i don't know if if he wins best picture for oppenheimer i i highly doubt he's going back over to warner's why would he have like full control at universal it makes no sense to go backwards but they are in a space right now where they are attempting to get more pedigree they are working on more Game of Thrones. There's that Harry Potter show. Some news about that's popped up, but I didn't prep it for today's episode. I'll talk about it tomorrow if anything new happens. But either way, what we're looking at here is a situation where, quite frankly, uh, Warner Brothers is, is going to try to reinvent themselves uh, in order to reclaim their relevance. When in reality, here's what they should do. And this is just being honest. Look at movies that have done well that cost very cheap. Uh, Godzilla minus one, notwithstanding, because that was done in a very specific way. However, look at rom-coms, okay? No hard feelings. Uh, it was anyone but you, uh, you know, no hard feelings. I forget who released that. I think that was at Lionsgate, Sony. I don't know. I know anyone but you was Sony. And that movie's done quite well. Focus on making mid to low budget movies that are genre focused, that can do well in the box office. This is what Jason Bloom does with horror movies. That's why he's been so successful is you can, you can do this. And I don't know why they don't keep doing this, why they are just so worried about it. Quite, quite frankly, it's, you can do this kind of stuff um, and make, make a lot of money in the process and really kind of refill your coffers because people will always justify paying for good entertainment. I mean, just flat out. But then you look at something like uh, Roadhouse, um, which um, I'll be talking about here in a few minutes, but Roadhouse for Amazon had a, $80 million budget or $85 million budget. And the movie was always planned for streaming. Like 
you don't need that much money to make a movie directly for streaming. You could, again, it's just Hollywood and their money and their accounting are so crazy that all it can do is just make you scratch your head. But then every once in a while, something comes along that 100% just makes everything uh, throw up in the air. And that is Godzilla minus one, especially coming in after Oppenheimer. And so there's an interview here with Takahashi, uh, with Takashi Yamazaki uh, about the striking connection between Godzilla minus one and Oppenheimer. And I got to say, I like what he has to say here because he does want to make a response to Oppenheimer, right? But anyway, let, let, let me just kind of break down the article. So Yamazaki revealed that when Oppenheimer came out, he desperately wanted to see it, right? This is a movie that ties in very heavily with what his movie is about. And so he actually had to fly to Taiwan and watch it with Chinese subtitles because the movie was not available in Japan. It hasn't even opened in Japan yet. It's going to open there soon, but like it hasn't come there yet. And it doesn't matter. Even though he went to Taiwan to go and see the movie, think about that. The guy jumps on a flight, flies, you know, to another country hours away just to watch a Chinese subbed version of Oppenheimer. He should have just pirated the damn thing and saved himself some money. I know people are going to sit there and go, but Matt, piracy is bad. I mean, look, this guy had the money to do it, so good for him, and it's a cool story to tell nonetheless. But still, even though he had language barriers, he still understood what the message was about nuclear threats and, and really understood what Nolan was trying to do, which is one of the reasons why Nolan is such a, a, a very gifted, very talented, visionary filmmaker. But as a Japanese director, Yamazaki had seen way more uh, like nuclear references in pop culture since childhood. And that maybe kind of influenced him a bit. He says that he uh, did want to provide some kind of answer or, or sorry, he does want to provide some kind of answer or response to Oppenheimer someday. I don't think Godzilla is necessarily a direct response to it, although they do point at similar themes. But even if this film is never realized, I think having it in the corner of my head as a strong thematic element is important. So, 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 Yamaz uh, so Yamazaki here is basically saying like, listen, I may not be able to convince Toho to let me make a spiritual successor to Oppenheimer under the Godzilla banner, but that idea will be there for the next project that I work on as a thematic element, meaning that like clearly you could sit there and go whatever he does, if it's like Godzilla minus two, which would be the most Hollywood sequel name ever for a movie like this. If they did that, we could all know that this is, this is meant to be a response to Oppenheimer, which I think is actually kind of cool and would actually be pretty interesting if they name dropped Oppenheimer in it. But at the same time, you got to remember though, that uh, Takashi Yamazaki also wrote the Godzilla minus run novel that was uh, published alongside the release of the movie, you know, a movie that he also wrote. So he could, he could easily write another script, another book and maybe have Toho put it out as like a graphic novel or put it out as a novel or an audio drama or something along those lines that wouldn't necessarily require the visual element of it, but still give you a, a lot of the uh, human elements, which is really what a lot of people took from this film. Because look, Godzilla minus one tackles related themes about nuclear warfare, right? It really does. It does it though in you know, a kaiju sort of way. Uh, and Yamazaki doesn't see it as a direct response to Oppenheimer, but you know, again, it's something that just they're, 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 they, the, the timing of their release kind of seems to work out, right? It's almost like counter, not even want to call it counter programming. It's very much complementary programming, even though the movies did release like six months apart. Uh, he does say that he uh, hopefully one day will be able to create a film uh, that does do this. Um, and uh, he very much just loves the idea and wants to work on it. And quite frankly, give this guy whatever he wants. This guy you know, showed Godzilla minus one at Lucasfilm. Dave Filoni uh, completely made that happen. To me, that's amazing. And I'm all for seeing what uh, Takashi Yamazaki does next. This man uh, is truly gifted, truly amazing. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know what, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll kiss the tip. You know what I'm saying? That's how good he is. That's how, that's how great he is, obviously. So why don't we talk about the big drama uh, uh, of the day. And that of course is Jake Gyllenhaal is, uh, kind of coming out and defending Amazon, defending the, uh, the, the roadhouse remake as always being, uh, made for streaming and, uh, you know, wants to, wants to make sure his side of it's heard as well as the lawsuit that's actually popped up today. That's a late, a late minute addition 
to this particular Roadhouse drama. So here's what we know. Uh, Gyllenhaal is trying to claim that the controversy around Roadhouse remake um, is, uh, or I should say he's trying to calm the controversy around the Roadhouse remake. He confirmed reports that the film was always intended for streaming, despite Doug Lyman's claims. Uh, Gyllenhaal and the producer took an $85 million streaming deal instead of a $60 million theatrical release. Now, the question that becomes, how much money did Jake Gyllenhaal get of that extra $25 million? How much of it was a payday for him, Conor McGregor, everyone else involved, right? You know, that's always a question that I have. If you're going to take the money up front, which is one of the things that streaming does is it pays the money up front. So they don't really have to pay out residuals. Now they're going to have to. But beforehand, it was, you know, that's, that's kind of how they did it. But he says here that the film's goal was to reach as wide of an audience as possible. And he's arguing that stories can profoundly move people, whether they're in theaters or via streaming, which right now is very true. Right now is very true. We know this. There's, there's always going to be the people that are going to demand that you watch movies in theaters. But the older I get, the more busier I get with work going full time, trying to do this podcast Monday through Friday, trying to find time to watch movies for patio commentary, to be with my kids, to be with my girlfriend, to take care of my cats, to see my family, all the other obligations that I have. Getting away to go watch a movie right now is very tough, very difficult for me. So I prefer to watch them at home because I can watch them on my own time. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to like present myself in any particular way. I can just sit there in bed, eat my popcorn that I like that costs me 30 cents to pop in an air popper and be happy. And that is where a lot of this stuff is going, as sad as it is to say. At no point am I saying don't go see movies in theaters, but we are at a point now where event programming is going to be what moves the needle more so than something like Roadhouse, which you could, you know, an $85 million middle of the road uh, remake of, of a classic film from the 80s, despite the talent in front of the camera and behind the camera is not going to be something that I'm going to be like, hey, yeah, let's run out to go see. You know what I mean? But Doug Lyman, on the other hand, kind of is the other way on this one. He's actually pretty strongly condemning Amazon in an essay saying that they had no interest in supporting theaters after indicating that they would. And he is a, a boycotting the South by Southwest premiere of the movie in protest. He's arguing that the streaming release hurts the filmmakers financially and deprives Gyllenhaal of possible awards recognition. He says it could negatively shape the industry for decades. That's all vanity. That is all vanity, right? I understand the filmmakers financially. That's why they get paid up front. I mean, I understand that the filmmakers will get like their points on the back end. Everyone gets their points on the back end. They'll get their bonuses, so on and so forth. But at the same time, do you really think that Roadhouse is going to be a movie that's going to bring a lot of people in? I personally don't. But when he's talking about the awards recognitions, again, that's vanity. To the average person, that's vanity. And the average person doesn't care. And these movies are made to make money. These movies are made to entertain. They should really maybe focus on that. Do I think they should have taken the $60 million and put the movie in theaters? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. I think the fact that they chose to not do that and then come out, at least with Doug Liman right now, to come out and make this claim at this moment in time, I think it's largely dumb. I think it's largely dumb. Uh, Gyllenhaal, on the other hand, got his money, he got his bag, and he's going to go off to do other movies. And so will Doug Liman. But these movies do take time to come together, and obviously that they care about them. So I get that. Uh, anyway, if you want to see the movie, I do want to see the movie, by the way, it comes out March 21st on Amazon prime. However, that might change. So here's what we know about the uh, follow-up lawsuit that was just filed today about the movie. So screenwriter R. Lance Hill, who wrote the original film has filed the lawsuit seeking a halt to the release of Roadhouse. He claims that Amazon infringed on his copyright by failing to properly license the rights to his original Roadhouse screenplay, which the remake is based on. The lawsuit explosively alleges as well that Amazon resorted to using AI to replicate actors' voices during the 2023 SAG strike to meet a November deadline, violating guild agreements. Amazon has denied these allegations. What I'm wondering about that, because I, I don't fully know how all this works out, I'm wondering if it's just the movie had to be done by November and because of the strike, they couldn't finish ADR and they couldn't finish everything that they needed to, which is a legitimate concern on the hands of Amazon. But if they did use AI or some other trickery in order to finish the movie surreptitiously, yeah, that's going to definitely be a problem. Uh, Hill wants an injunction against the film's release plus damages, claiming his statutory termination of Amazon's rights was valid as of November 2023, so they had no right to distribute the remake. 
Amazon, on the other hand, insists that the termination was valid or is invalid, but sources say the production rushed to complete filming before his November 2023 termination date. So they did need to finish the movie before November 2023. Clearly they did that, but uh, how they got there, I guess, is what's going to be uh, maybe found out in Discovery. So the lawsuit has stirred fears about the use of AI in Hollywood. Uh, even if Amazon didn't use AI, the allegations alone may negatively impact upcoming studio negotiations with talent guilds. I don't think it's going to, to be honest with you. I think I think largely Fran Drescher has completely borked the entire argument on AI in regards to actors. I mean, they they signed a deal with that company to uh, to 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 do uh, to license you know uh, AI voices from actors or to have actors license their voices to this company for video game purposes or whatever, right? And, and that is coming after all the months of them, you know, poo-pooing AI, claiming that these studios want to own your likeness rights in perpetuity, even though that was an absolute lie. The whole thing was a scam. We know it was a scam. We know that they were just lying to get uh, people's attention on it because the fear of AI in 2023 was pretty massive. You know, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of doomerism about it. We know all this stuff now. And I, I've been saying it from the rooftops since it happened anyway. And I just love that I, I keep getting proved right more and more and more and more and more. But still, it's the idea here that uh, these these companies need to figure out a way to properly use, license, regulate, and control AI in this space. Make no mistake, as much as I like it, we need to have those things. That's very true. But that being said, uh, Hill and his legal team now want a court validation of his termination being valid, meaning Amazon would have no rights to make or release Roadhouse after november 2023 so basically uh he wants money from amazon and amazon is probably going to settle to put the money out to put the movie out there but there's already so much negativity and so much bad press around this film right now it really does kind of make you question um where where we are with it where what's happening with it and exactly what could potentially be happening with it and even that is still not as bad as you know, Netflix doing its thing because Netflix is once again getting ready to raise prices in 2024, considering it raised them a couple times in the past couple years and people are getting real sick and tired. So here's what we know about this. Financial analysts are predicting that Netflix will raise its prices once again in 2024. Uh, this will and it should definitely boost their revenue and profits as more people watch Netflix. Because remember, you've got Peacock, you've got Paramount Plus, you've got Hulu and the Disney bundle, you've got Amazon Instant or Amazon Prime, whatever. All of these things, all of these others that are out there and they're all raising their prices and eventually people are just going to choose the one that they know the best or they're going to choose three, most likely Disney, Amazon and Netflix. And they're going to bundle Amazon or Disney and Hulu together and that's what you're going to end up getting. Okay, and I, th I think Netflix is aware of this, especially because they made a lot of money when they cracked down on password sharing. However, a Netflix executive did say that they would likely resume standard price hikes after pausing them last year during their crackdown on password sharing, because that's how they got people to, to pay, right? Well, you know, we're going to we're going to like calm down on charging you more money for this stuff uh, while we try to get, you know, while we shame you. And while we blame you for using password sharing and VPNs to be able to watch this content. But the data did show that Netflix viewing time increased at the start of 2024. And Netflix also remains cheaper viewing per hour than competitors like Disney and Hulu. And that's again, that's the bundle package right there. I think it's like 30 cents an hour is what you pay for like the Netflix, right? That's about how what the average is. Now, other streaming services focus more on profits and uh, over attracting new subscribers. But Netflix actually stands to benefit the most from these industry changes of uh, focusing more on subscribers because that, again, is playing like the long game. The, uh, the experts forecast a strong growth in Netflix's earnings over the next four years. This expected profit growth supports plans to buy back more Netflix stock shares. Now, that's the whole thing. That's the whole point. They want to buy back their stock, which means that they will then get more money. That's just what corporate America does. This has been happening a lot with uh, with after the pandemic and the corporate bailouts and, and the record profits. They were using their money. These corporations were using these these record breaking profits not to pay their employees more money and not to lower the cost of goods and services. But no, they were doing it to buy back their stock. So they themselves would then be wealthier. Now, Netflix is not only doing all that supposedly in 2024, but here's what they actually are doing for real, if you happen to have uh, an Apple 
device, an Apple phone, a MacBook, a uh, an Apple TV Plus, whatever, and you pay for Netflix through that, uh, you are going to be stopping doing that. They're actually going to cancel your account if you do that. Here's what the article is saying. Netflix is making U.S. users move from paying via Apple's App Store billing to its own payment method. In 2018, Netflix restricted new App Store subscriptions but didn't block existing ones. Now, some Apple Build members in select countries are being prompted to add a new non-App Store payment method to continue their subscription. This likely maximizes Netflix's revenue since it avoids paying Apple an additional 15% cut. Usually, Apple takes 30%. So 15, they're getting off real good at 15%. If if you uh, pay a super chat, if you become a channel member, if if you buy a super sticker or a super thanks here on YouTube uh, and you have an Apple device, Apple takes 30% of that before even it goes to YouTube. So yeah, it's like Apple, they take 30%. That's a lot of money. Uh, and the users who want to keep the service uh, should, and they have an Apple device, should just subscribe right through Apple's or through Netflix's own website uh or they're going to end up getting suspended and that and that is not just like for apple but i mean like honestly if you do that through any device right just do it through your computer link it to your phone your tablet your laptop whatever save yourself that extra hassle because if you go through at least a mobile device and it's going through either the play store or the app store they take a cut and these companies don't want to pay them and that's just you know the reality of it but anyway that brings me to the end of hollywood after dark for today thank you guys so much for listening i really appreciate it Leave your thoughts, leave your opinions. We will chit chat again tomorrow. Have yourself a great day, everybody. Thank you again. And remember, peace the hell out. <laughs>